Gen 2 Linux is the distro of choice if you enjoy torturing yourself and you don't like having any spare time in your life. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, Gen 2 is a distribution where you can highly customize and optimize the installation down to every single package based on your hardware. And it lets you have a system that is completely custom, has exactly what you want, and none of the stuff that you don't want. So unlike other distros where they choose for you what each package is going to support, this will build each individual package how you tell it to. Now, as you can see, this is Gen 2 running KDE Plasma 5.20 on hardware. And I also have a virtual machine here running Gen 2 with the GNOME desktop. They both work very well. They're both super smooth and they are built from scratch, which is how you do things in Gen 2. So I'm going to go through the whole install from scratch here and you can just follow along. I'm going to mention certain things that might trip you up and little tricks that you could do along the way. And then in the end, we're going to end up with a fully functioning working desktop. I'm actually going to do Plasma, not GNOME, but um, I'll show you how to install the different things. You can also do XFCE, but enough talking. So let's just get on with it. So now before I get started, what is Gentoo and what makes it different? Yeah, Gentoo is actually a penguin, but it's also a Linux distribution. So what makes everything different is that you install everything from scratch and it's completely customizable. So in a typical distro, the source code for a program will be loaded into a compiler. This could be a developer's computer or it could be a server that does this automatically. And the compiler will turn the source code into computer readable binary executables. Then those executables go to a repo that everyone can access from their distribution. So when you download software, you download the executables from the repo. That's a bit simplistic on how it works, but that's basically how a typical distro works. Now what's different with Gentoo is the original source code is uploaded directly to a repository, along with a few other files that give instructions on how it should be built and how it should be compiled. Then when you go to install something on your computer, the original source code along with those scripts are downloaded to your computer and your computer is what compiles it into an executable. And that's where the advantage comes in because when you're compiling it on your computer, it's using all the settings, the flags, the optimizations to customize it for your computer the way you want it set up. Now, again, this is rather generalized and might sound a little complicated, but it's really not. Gentoo has a lot of awesome tools to do these things for you and it's set up to be fairly easy to use so just follow along and we'll go through the whole process here so why is this important well for one there's different kinds of people out there who are going to use gentoo there are those who want the most performance they can squeeze out of their machine which means it is completely customized for their hardware and has exactly what they need this speeds up the execution time and whatnot and then there's the other people who just want to learn Linux. And this is a great way to learn Linux because you really get to see the inside under the hood look of how things are put together and how they're all linked together because you have to do everything yourself. So even if you don't want to do this yourself, you can still watch this video and get a good understanding of how everything is done as I do it. I'll also talk more about how it works throughout the video. So just follow along and we'll, we'll go from there. Um, you'll also see how when these different programs are compiled, you can exclude support for certain things that you're not going to use. So for example, if you don't want system D, you can actually put a flag that excludes system D so that every single program that is compiled on your distribution will not support system D because it's built that way because you told it to. This also saves you a lot of time um, setting things up and makes everything run a little bit quicker. So this is the download page where you're going to download your installation ISO file that you can put on a USB stick or a CD. You've got the AMD64, which is probably the one you're going to want, or you can get the plain old x86 32-bit. So just go ahead and download that. And 
This wiki, by the way, is very complete. So if there's a step that doesn't quite match up with your system, you can read all about it. There's details on absolutely everything. So then you also have these stage three archives that you can download, which is a minimal system to get Gentoo up and running. But we're actually gonna download that from within the virtual machine once it's up and running. So here we go with my virtual machine. I have a 30 gig disc and I'm going to insert the USB. Make sure this boots up. Now, if you're not sure what to do with that ISO file you downloaded, um, you could use Etcher to put it on a USB stick. You can, if you're using Windows, you could use Rufus. If you're using a virtual machine, you can just load the ISO directly in uh, just the way that I did here. So if you're using VirtualBox or whatever, you'll have um, a spot where you can load a virtual CD-ROM and just choose that ISO file that you downloaded. So we'll go ahead and fire this up. And this is the grub menu. Yours might look a little different. I made this virtual machine an EFI virtual machine. So if you just have a BIOS one, it'll look a little different, but it's all the same. And as we go through the instructions, as I said, you'll have the different instructions on how to do different things, depending on how you set up your hardware or your virtual machine. So I missed that menu there, that menus, it gives you a chance to select a different language for your keyboard. And by default, it selects US. Okay, so this is it. This is the live CD. I'm just gonna scale this so it's a little bigger for you guys. And this is what we're gonna work out of for a while at the beginning. I'll just bring up the Gen 2 page again so that we can kind of follow along as we go through. And you're gonna click the get started and then scroll down to the Gen 2 handbook. And then you can scroll down and select your architecture. So AMD 64 is what we're working with. So we're gonna choose that. And then here you have all the different sections that we're gonna go through to get this thing up and running. Feel free to pause the video. I'm gonna skip certain things that you could read on your own, which will just take way too much time in this video. So about the installation and choosing the right installation medium, we just did that. So I'm gonna skip this part and we're gonna go to configuring the network. So configuring the network, as you can see in the wiki, it literally tells you what to type and it gives you examples on everything. So it's super easy. It's great to walk through and we're just gonna, we're just gonna go along with what's in the handbook, even though some things I'm going to do to save time. So right off the bat here, it's telling you to determine your interface names, which is as easy as typing ifconfig. And you can see here my network name, EMP0S3. That's the network card that the virtual machine is using. So by the way, if you're using a virtual machine, you can do what I'm doing. If you're using it on hardware and you have nothing else, um, I would say make sure you have a cell phone or something else where you can follow along with this. Because obviously when you're using your only machine, this makes it a lot more difficult. So remember, if you hit a snag, you're gonna want to read some of these things here. Basically for me, it's going to work. I can go here. If you have proxies, I don't have it. Ping, so okay, I want to ping gentoo.org and you can see it is working. So basically I don't have to do any troubleshooting because it's working. If you're using, trying to use Wi-Fi, which I don't recommend, or you have a proxy or other things, you might wanna go through some more of these steps. Scrolling further down, if for some reason you have a strange uh, NIC where your network interface card where it's not detecting it at all, then there's troubleshooting sections here on how to get it to work. You'll probably also need DHCP working, which we will visit again later. And then you have a section for wireless access, which doesn't apply to us. Again, it's a virtual machine. And then understanding network terminology, it's gonna go through some stuff. So really, if you're, if you're wanting to learn Linux, this is fantastic and this will explain everything for you. So basically the whole point of this section is make sure your network is running, which it is, because as you're installing, it is pulling stuff from the internet. So since it's working, we can go to the next step, which is preparing the disks. This is something that if you wanted to um, save time or do ahead of time, you could load um, like the Gparted Live ISO and pre-partition your partitions with a 
graphical user interface if you wanted to, but we're just going to type all this stuff out. It's not really that hard. Again, it explains everything. Like if you're using an NVMe, you're going to see these. If you're using SATA drives, you're going to see these, which we're going to see in my virtual machine. And again, even if you're lost at this point, just follow along. I'm going to explain everything along the way. So we're just going to skip down here and going to use GPT. Remember to read everything before you do things. If you have an older BIOS based computer and it doesn't have EFI, you might want to use the MBR boot sector. It precedes GPT. So really old system, you're going to use MBR. Newer system with EFI, you're going to use GPT. Advanced storage, we're not going to use. So no ButterFS, no LVM. We're just going to do basic partitions here. And I'm basically just going to follow what it wants us to do. It's going to talk about swap space, the BIOS boot partition. And again, this is all stuff that as I do the steps, I'm going to explain it. So EFI system partition. This is important because as it says, the ESP must be a fat variant. Sometimes you'll see guides where it makes it an EXT partition. Don't do that. It's not going to work well. So let's just go down. This is what we're going to do. So it's going to be SDA 1, 2, 3, and 4. It's going to be your BIOS boot partition, boot partition, swap partition, and root partition. Now, viewing the current partition layout with parted. So let's get started here. This command is going to be the drive that you're going to be working on. So SDA. If you don't know what your drive is and you want to confirm, you do fdisk-l. And you can see here, all the stuff above here, the RAM stuff, we don't care. That's what the live ISO is using. We want this, which is dev SDA. Again, if you have an NVMe drive, it's going to be slash dev slash NVMe 0NP, whatever, whatever it's going to be. This is what we want to know, SDA. So just do what it says. So parted a optimal dev SDA. And now we are in parted. And next step is setting the GPT label. So make label GPT, done. And again, this is when you have to read ahead a little bit before you do things. To have the disk with MBR layout, use make label MS-DOS. So if you have an old system that doesn't have EFI, you're gonna use this. I don't like that they put these things after the commands sometimes, but it happens. So follow along with my video or just go ahead and make sure you read a little bit the entire section before you go ahead and type in commands. So removing all partitions, there's no need because we don't have any, but you can confirm that with print and it shows nothing down here, which means there are no partitions. If you do see some, you could do RM1, RM2, RM3 and just delete them. So now let's create our partitions. We're gonna go unit mib, this tells the program that we're going to be working in megabytes and then just follow along here. So we're going to go make partition primary one, three, name one grub, set one BIOS grub on and then print. And now we can see that our one partition is created. Now, in case you're wondering this one, three, those are the start and ends of the partition. So then we'll carry on and make part primary three, which is our start where the last one ended to 131. Name it boot. Name number two boot. And then we're going to make part primary starting at 131. This is going to be our swap partition. So I'm going to go Instead of 643, which is going to give us about 500 meg partition, I'm going to go uh, 8,100, so approximately 8 gigs. And then I'm going to name 3 swap. And we're going to make part primary 8,100 minus 1. Minus 1 tells it to go to the end of the disk minus 1 megabyte. And then we're going to name for the root file system. And then note here, if you're using UEFI, uh, mark the boot partition as the UEFI system partition. So we're going to do set to boot on and then print. So now we can see the four partitions we created. We've got our BIOS boot, our EFI boot, an eight gig, almost eight gig swap. 
and then a 22 gig root file system. So that is what we wanted. Now we can quit. There's an alternative here and they have alternatives for a lot of things. You could use F disk to partition the disk as well. It's similar, different way of doing it, just a different program, but we're going to skip this section and skip, remove, create, create the boot partition, root partition, saving layout. Okay. So that's done. Now creating the file system. We've created our four partitions, but they don't have file systems inside. So the different file systems are ButterFS, ext2, ext3, ext4. There's a bunch of different ones. We're not going to use most of these. We're going to use ext4 and vfat, and we'll cover that as we go through. And let's just go down here. We can skip this. This is for really small partitions. This tells you how to apply a file system to a partition. Again, I'm going to do it so you can read this on your own time. But for the sake of the video, I'm just going to go through here and it gives you some different examples here. So what we're going to do is make FS VFAT for dev SDA one, which is our first partition. And we're going to do the same thing for two. Then we're going to make FS ext4 for dev sda4, which is our root file system. So we've created everything for one, two, and four. Last is the swap partition, which is sda3. And that one is make swap dev sda3. Then you can activate the swap partition with swap on slash dev slash sda3. So now we have our file system all set up and now we can actually get into our system and start loading things into our operating system. So we're gonna mount device SDA4, which is our root file system to mount Gen2. So what we've done here with the mount command is we've made the mount Gen2 directory go into device SDA4 which is the partition we created. So now it talks about temp being on a separate partition, which is which it isn't. So we can skip that and go to installing stage three. Now this is gonna pull that stage three archive into our system. So we have a base system to work out of. So date and time, if your hardware is out of sync, you're gonna to wanna to make sure it's good to go. Uh, I can see here that my system is fine, that the time is right. If not, you're gonna to have to do some of these commands, use a uh, network time to get it going. And here it's going to talk about choosing the right stage tarball. There's a lot of links in this wiki you're going to want to read. And I know it's jumping back and forth. It's frustrated me before, but you could see, you know, when it's time to choose a system profile, you can click on that and it'll skip ahead to something in the future, but it's something you can read about along the way, or don't worry about it unless it tells you, you must do this first go and do that and then come back. So we have multi-lib and no multi-lib. It tells you right there, should not choose no multi-lib unless absolutely necessary. You'll know this in the future if you really do not need any 32-bit support, but let's, uh, let's not go there just yet. Let's just do what the guide tells us to do. So downloading the stage tarball, we're gonna go back into here and it tells you to paste the URL of the stage three that you want to download. Now, it doesn't work in a virtual machine. It obviously won't work on hardware, but we can use Lynx. Lynx is a terminal-based web browser. So we're going to go HTTPS www.gentoo.org. And this is going to open up a browser for us. Now, if you keep going, it's going to tell you that you can also use Lynx. It gives you instructions if you have a proxy and it tells you select a mirror close by and go into AMD 64 auto builds directory. So again, this is, you know, something you read ahead a little bit before you actually go in and do it. So let's go ahead and jump into this browser. Okay. And then we're going to use the arrows to go down. Uh, all right. So you're basically going to highlight your links and then hit enter. So North America, CA, Canada, uh, let's choose sure terabyte.com do that 
releases, AMD 64, auto builds, and here these are all dates. So 2021, February 27th. Uh, so let's pick this one, 2021, 0303. So this is a date and time group. So go ahead in here. Here you've got minimal, standard package, no multi-lib, which it said not to pick, system D, which we're not gonna pick, and X32. So we want this amd64.tar.xz. Go ahead, hit enter, and save it. So now we're going to give it a name, hit enter. It's gonna download it. And then once it's done, we can go ahead and exit out of this and continue on with the guide. Okay, so it's done downloading. Just go hit escape, file, exit. Do you want to exit? Yes. So now if we do a list, there's our stage three tarball that we wanted to download. Now next is telling us to verify and validate, which I'm going to skip and we're going to unpack it. So we're going to do just what it says. XPVF stage three. You can just hit tab and it'll auto complete the file name. You're going to go you're going to go X A T T R S attributes include equals star dot star. Numeric owner. Go ahead and run that and it will unpack the tarball into your new partition that you created. All right. So that finished uh, configuring compile options is a point I think where some people will start to get overwhelmed and think that they're getting in too deep, but you're not. This is what I was talking about, where you customize and tune your system to build these things at a, an optimal rate. Basically just do what it says here, make.conf. So I'll just move this down here, kind of make some room here. And it's gonna tell you, okay, I'll go over the flags here before I go back to the terminal. It's going to tell you to set all these flags and it gives you an example down here of what it wants it to look like. So these flags are to tune your processor to, to make it work as fast as possible. Seems complicated, but it's not. There's a little link down here that says safe C flags. Go ahead and click on that. And here it's going to list all the different processors. You need to know what processor your computer has. So just go ahead and Google your system check out what model you have, how many cores, how much RAM. This is all important things to know to tune your system. And so for me, I'm going to go AMD Ryzen and it is a 3000 series. So I'm going to want my C flags to say this. So let's go ahead and change common flags here. Let's just make it say what it says to say March equals ZN version two. March ZN version two. Yep, that's right. And then I don't have C host. So let's just add C host equals. Just like that. And the CXX flags, I've never changed this before. So I'm just gonna leave that as is. So now that's done. Let's go back here setting the flags. You can read all this if you want, but what I'm doing is basically what it wants you to do. The last thing you're going to want to set here is make ops. And this is going to tell the compiler how many cores it can use to compile a program. So like I said, you need to know how many cores or threads your system has. So if you have an i7 with four cores, eight threads, your number is eight. So I'm going to go make ops equals J12, because I have 12 cores on this machine. So this means when the system is compiling, it can do 12 things at the same time. Now there's another important thing I'm gonna mention here is they recommend two gigs per thread. This means if you only have eight gigs of RAM, you should only set this to four. Even if you have 16 threads, you should only set it to four because it's two gigs per thread. So two times four, eight or you have eight gigs of RAM divided by two, that's what you should set this number as. Now, in my case, I have 12 threads and 24 gigs of RAM, so I can set this at 12. And you can see right here, have two gigs of RAM for every job specified. 
So J6 requires 12 gigs. So we've said how many jobs can run at the same time and we're gonna save this and go. But before doing that, while I'm here, something else I'm gonna do while I'm here, this is up to you. I'll point this out later as well, but I'm going to put accept license star. This is something for you to decide. Each piece of software has a different license. And again, I'll be looking at this again later, but if you only want free software, you're gonna change this for me. I just want to build. I don't particularly want to be hindered by licenses and I, I personally don't care, but it is up to you what you want to do. I want to accept whatever license any software has and just install it. So now we're going to do control O enter and control X. So save and exit. And then we can move on to installing the base system. So let's scroll down here and select our mirrors. So mirror select dash I dash O. mount gen2 etc portage make.conf this is going to select what mirrors you want to use from the internet and help you get the fastest ones possible so it's pretty self-explanatory here you're going to see your list on the right so i'm going to choose some mirrors in canada uh sure that works so that works so hit OK, and it's saved. And what this command did was it put the output into that make.com file that we were looking at earlier. So let's keep going down. We're going to make a ebuild repository. OK, for some reason, my screen recorder stopped, but I caught it before getting much further. So basically, all I did was run these two commands here for the repository. After that, you can cat this file. If you want to see what's inside, it's up to you. I'm not going to do that. And then I ran this command, which is copying the DNS info. And what this is going to do is allow the ch rooted system to be able to reach the internet once we ch root into our new install. Again, if there's some of these things you don't understand, I'll explain it as I get to them, like ch root. So yeah, I already copied that. And next thing is going to be mounting all of these. These are going to be required to ch root into your system and get things going. So basically just type these up. Okay, so I typed all those with a few mistakes because it's hard to <laughs> type when you have a cat that decided to sit between you and your keyboard, but uh, he's moved on now. So <laughs> these are all done. All those are mounted. And then here you're going to get a warning. If you're using a non Gen 2 installation media, we are using a Gen 2 installation media, so that's not really a concern. But if you're using, say, a live USB from some other distribution, you're going to want to run this stuff, but we don't need to do that. So we're going to just carry on with entering the environment, finally. So uh, Gen 2, and we want to use Bash. So ch root, we're going to change root. Right now we're running off of the, the live CD, the ISO. What we're doing now is we are entering the partition and loading into it like as if we booted off of it. So hit enter and there we are, no errors, good to go. This is why earlier those other mounts with proc and dev and sys, we had to do those because we're giving this new environment access to the devices and the processes and whatnot. So just keep on going profile. This is loading various environment variables for bash. And then we're going to export PS1. This you can, you can have it say whatever you want, but this is basically, I'll wait till I'm done here. <laughs> this is basically changing the prompt. So if you hit enter, you could see now it says ch root live CD. This basically is just an indicator to remind you that you're in the ch root environment, you're no longer on the ISO. So at this point, we are now in the new partition in the new system. So now let's scroll down and let's mount our boot partition into boot. So you could just type mount again and you could see uh, SDA2 mounted on boot. If you ever want to double check to make sure that it worked, just type mount and it'll show you all the mount points. 
So now at this point, we're going to install a snapshot of the Gentoo eBuild repository. Again, there are notes underneath the command saying it might complain about missing things. It's to be expected, don't worry about it. Let's go ahead and emerge and web our sync. And we have an error, let's have a look here. Make conf no closing quotation. Okay, so I'm guessing I made an error. Uh, I haven't typed it yet in here. I made an error, which I'm gonna go have a look at. Make.conf, I forgot a quote somewhere. Yes, I put the wrong quote here. There we go, that should fix it. Okay, let's try that again. Emerge WebR Sync. There we go. So this actually happened to me before with make ops. I actually forgot a quote completely and it did the same thing. So it gives you gives you a hint, missing quotation. Right, go ahead, have a look. I actually looked a couple of times before I noticed it. And uh, yeah, it is what it is. So I'll let this go. Uh, you'll be able to see what it's wanting to do. And we're already done. So that was actually pretty quick. So from this point onward, yada, yada, yada. So we want to update the Gen 2 build repository with emerge sync. And this will take a couple of minutes. Uh, it, it says here too, on slow terminals, again, famous for mentioning things after the command, on slow terminals, you might want to put slash quiet so that it's not putting stuff on the screen. So if you have a really old piece of hardware, you might want to do that so that it's not wasting any time printing things. So I'll let this go and then I'll resume whenever it's done. All right, so we're done. And as you could see, this is going to be the next step anyways, but it mentions again, important six new items need reading. And that's actually the next section here is reading news items. So this could be important. It doesn't hurt to have a look at it. So we can do eselect news list, and it's gonna show you the news items that you can read. This is some important things that may or may not affect you. Usually has to do with recent changes, uh, changes in how they configure things and whatnot, or things that are upcoming. So now if you want to have a look, like let's say uh, the change of accept license default, we want to have a look at that. So we're going to do the select news read, and it is number three. And I would pipe this into less. That way you can actually scroll through if it's longer. And it's just going to tell you something about something. So cue to quit. And now when you go look at the list, it'll say that it's no longer a, a new item and uh, you can just do read with nothing and it'll print all of it. You can see we've read it all. So next step is profiles. So this is important here. The profile is basically what is being used as a base for your system. And I'll show you here. If we do eselect profile list, it's going to show you all the available profiles. Now what this is going to do is it's going to set some things for you in how the system works. So certain flags, certain requirements for the different packages is gonna set up your base system to be optimized how you want it and what you intend to do with it. So you can see in the list here, we've got SE Linux, hardened, desktop, GNOME, GNOME with systemd, Plasma, Plasma with systemd, uh, multi-lib, and then a whole bunch of dev uh, profiles, developer profiles. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to choose plasma stable and it is line number eight because I don't want system D. So we're going to go here and we're going to e-select profile set to. So now I've set myself to profile number two, which is the wrong one because I wanted eight. I was literally just typing what was there. <laughs> I want eight, which was plasma. Yes, plasma stable, not the one with system D. All right, and then if we continue here, this has different examples, system D. I don't recommend system D for the first time. It uses OpenRC by default. If you follow this guide, we're gonna use OpenRC instead of system D. It's super easy to use. 
system D is very complicated to set up and is not necessary. So for your first system, I say do OpenRC. It's easy, easy, easy to use. And if you want to do system D later, you can, but this is my recommendation. It's up to you how, how you want to build it, but you have been warned. So scrolling down now, it's saying updating the at world set. So the following step is necessary. So the system can apply any updates or use flag changes, which have appeared since stage three was built. There's something else I'm going to do here. And yes, I'm skipping ahead. I'm going to go ahead and edit our make.conf file again. And in here, I'm going to add some use flags and I'll tell you what I'm doing and why I'm doing this. A bunch of stuff is going to start getting pulled in and compiled. Now I'm using a virtual machine. If you're using a PC, you may want to do this as well. Use flags work in a way that you're telling it what you want to use and what you don't want to use. So things that I don't want to use are Bluetooth and system D. Now it's probably already going to exclude system D because I chose the plasma without system D, but I want to make sure that nothing system D is compiled or installed in my system. Uh, another thing I'm going to add is Qt web engine and web engine. And I'm not hundred percent sure. Sorry, put the negative, which means you don't want, um, now I'm not hundred percent sure if it's, Qt web engine or web engine, but one of these or both of these are something that Falcon uses and a couple of other programs, and it takes hours and hours and hours to build, and you don't really need it. I found I didn't need it for me saving time in this video. I'm going to put this in because it is long. Don't want Bluetooth, don't want system D, don't want web engine. And that's good enough for now. Yes, I jumped ahead a little bit here. So control O, enter, control X. I just don't want to have to redo this again later on. So now we're gonna update the at world set. Again, just like everything else, if you wanna know what it is, you can go ahead and read it. So we're gonna do emerge ask verbose update deep new use at world. There's a shorter way to type this, but this is basically explaining to you what it's doing. The ask option is always important because it will show you what it's going to do. And then it's going to ask you, do you want me to continue or not? If you don't put ask, it's just going to go ahead and do it. So if it does something you didn't intend, you're not going to be able to catch it. Well, you can control C and kill it, but ask is always a good thing to have. So let's go ahead and run this and it's going to start merging things. So a lot of stuff flashed by the screen and you can see we have an error. We have circular dependencies. Now this is one of the errors you might get that you can just Google, but it also tell you here, you can break the cycle by applying any of the following changes to use. So you could say minus SQLite or minus ICU, depending on what you want to use. So if we want to use the Python, we could do minus SQLite. So let's go ahead and do that. So under here, let's do minus SQLite, save it, and we're going to run that command again. There are other things we're going to see throughout this video where there's going to be an additional step or something that you have to do, and I'll explain that. The wiki also explains everything, but yeah, you're watching the video, might as well cover it as we go through. So would you like to merge these packages? Yes, I would. Now this is going to take a while, 220 packages. Uh, I, I missed how much space it was going to take, but, uh, yeah, this is going to take a while. So what it's doing now is in another distribution, it would just be downloading your packages and installing them. What Gentoo is doing is it's downloading source code compiling the programs and installing them. So all those use flags that we put with minus Bluetooth, minus SQLite, minus systemd, it's compiling all these programs to not support those things. I don't have Bluetooth on my system. So why do I want any of the programs to 
support Bluetooth, right? So this is part of Gen 2's appeal for a lot of people is that you can say, I don't want this, I don't want that, and it won't install it. Now this is gonna take a little while, so I'm just gonna let this go and uh, we'll be back. Okay, so that's done, and that took about two and a half hours. Now, I wasn't kidding earlier when I said free time. Um, now, you're not doing this all the time. This is just the install, and it had to rebuild a bunch of stuff and create a bunch of stuff. There's a few spots throughout this where you're just going to have to let it go and then check on it later. So now the next section talks about configuring use variables. You saw this earlier when I was editing Portage's make.conf file. This is what tells the system what you want to use and what you don't want to use. Now you can see this command here, emerge dash dash info. This command will tell you what is currently in use in the system. Now it shows a little bit too much because it seems to carry on sometimes with the other variables. So you just have to find where the ending quote is. So in my case here, after the quote, it says ABI underscore X86. So everything before that is the use flags. So you can see that it's using X, uh, ACPI, ALSA, AMD64, and a whole bunch of other things. Now this is handy uh, for certain cases where if you're not gonna use GNOME, you don't have to include GNOME. So here's an example, if you wanna use KDE Plasma with DVD, ALSA, and CD re recording support. You just exclude GTK, exclude GNOME, and then you include what you want. Alternatively, you can exclude everything, and then you can put whatever you want to include to be used. Now, it says right there, not, not recommended, because when you're installing certain meta packages, it's gonna set flags for you, and those are important. You don't wanna exclude those, but if you're at the point where now you're experimenting with complete customization, you really want to be precise in what is being supported and installed. You can go ahead and do this, but like I said, I don't recommend this uh, for the first couple of tries, but that's up to you. The next section talks about the accept license variable, which I um, briefly touched on earlier when I said accept license equals star. And you can see here what all the different options are for whatever licenses you want to accept. And like I said, it's up to you what kind of software you want to accept. For me, I personally don't care. I want to accept everything that is available. Then we have optional using system D as the init system. If you want to do that, there's a whole other section over here, system D that you have to follow. And it's quite involved. Personally, it's just so much easier to follow the guide and use OpenRC. It works great. I haven't had any issues. You're not hindering anything. If there's something you need that specifically needs systemd, you might want to explore that. But for now, let's just carry on with using OpenRC. So we're basically going to skip that section. So now I'm going to go ahead and set the time zone. So you can do LS, USR, share, zone info, and you can see all the different zones available. And then you can also go into, say, America, and then you can list that, and you can see all the different time zones available in America. So for me, I'll just do Echo America slash uh, Denver. You can pick whatever you want, whatever your time zone is, and put it into ETC slash time zone. And then we're going to reconfigure the time zone data package with emerge config syslibs time zone data. And that's done. So now we move on to the locales. If you're not using the same one I am, you're gonna to want to look up whichever one you need to use for your locale. So for me with my language and keyboard, I'm just gonna do the UTF-8, English US dot UTF-8 space UTF-8. Save and close, and then locale gen, which will generate all the locales. Now that it's generated, we have to actually select it. Now you can see in this list, the locale that I want is four, which is the one that I just added. So we'll do eselect locale set four. 
Uh, and then it talks about manually doing it. You don't really have to do that, but that is an option. And then we're going to reload our environment with all the new things that we've just set. So now we're good. And the next step is configuring the kernel. Now, I think this is a, a good time to uh, take a little break here in the video. I'm going to carry on in the second video with uh, installing, configuring and installing the kernel and then finalizing the system setup, adding a user, and then I'll get into installing the Xorg server and KDE Plasma so we have a nice desktop environment. And then once that's all set up, we can go through updating the system and installing additional software and customizing some more things. So if you're still watching at this point, you can see how it is a little bit time consuming. The setup itself isn't that bad. It's just some jumping around and a lot of reading. And by the way, if you've gotten up to this point and you need to take a break and want to shut it down or whatnot, whether you're using a virtual machine or you're using a actual piece of hardware with a USB plugged into it or, or CD, DVD, you can go ahead and shut it down if you want or if you have to. And then once you want to get back into it, you just do those first few steps of mounting all those partitions again and CH root back into the system. And then you'll be back at the point we're at now. So we'll just carry on in the next video. But before moving on, don't forget to like and don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you then.